evening, everyone. My name is Mike Janice. I'm the manager of communications here at the Windsor Essex County Health Unit. Thank you for joining us. I uh, just want to thank everyone for joining this virtual meeting with Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I want to thank the school boards for helping us promote this event. Uh, we received around 100 and over 120 questions. So what we've done is we've kind of themed them together into 10 broad categories. Um, we're going to try to keep this meeting to about an hour and address all those questions. And then if we have time for additional questions, we ask that you use the chat function in Microsoft Teams, and then we'll ask those questions of Dr. Ahmed. Uh, we are recording the session, and we also have a public health nurse. Her name's Kelly uh, Lawrenson, who is, will, if there's any questions in French, she'll be able to translate them and uh, also provide the response in French, in French from Dr. Ahmed. Uh, just ask that the questions be respectful and we'll get started. So um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Wajid Ahmed, our medical officer of health, who took time out of his busy schedule to, do, to answer questions from parents. And again, thank you for all the questions that we received. Um, Dr. Ahmed, I pass it on to you. Thank you, Mike, and uh, I would just like to echo what Mike said. Thank you for taking the time to uh, join this session. Uh, it's been a pleasure working in this community and uh, looking the, the progress of how vaccine rollout has been happening in our community, recognizing that we are at a critical juncture where uh, a lot of our uh, people are vaccinated, and now we are moving forward to vaccinating our 12 plus people, uh, our children and uh, making sure that uh, if you have any questions uh, that we are able to address those questions. As Mike indicated, it's it's been great. Uh, it's so far it's been a great response and the question that we have received uh, from many of you. So I'll try to address uh, these questions uh, as best as possible. And uh, Mike will ask these questions and uh, I will try to answer uh, each of these questions based on the theme uh, various team because some of these questions are pretty much related. And if you have any other questions that you want to share, uh, you can put it in, a, in the chat box. And uh, as time permits, we will try to address those questions from the chat box as well. So over to Mike uh, for facilitating these questions. And uh, maybe we can start, Mike. Mike. Sure. So the first question revolves around eligibility for vaccine for youth based on age, health condition, medications, COVID-19 status. So which vaccines are approved for them at this moment in time? So focusing just on the children at this time, uh, which uh, and we're, when we're talking about children 12 plus 12 to 17, um, the only vaccine that is approved in Canada for this age group is Pfizer BioNTech and uh, the rest of the vaccine are approved for uh, children or for adults 18 years and older. Uh, not to say that other vaccine will not be effective in the younger population, but just because of the regulation and the regulatory approval uh, process that it takes to approve these vaccines, uh, we'll have to look at the data and uh, the clinical trial data uh, in the specific age group. And based on that, uh, Pfizer-BioNTech is the only vaccine that has been currently approved in Canada uh, to be used for 12 to 17 years of age. We are anticipating that uh, Moderna, uh, the other uh, mRNA vaccine, uh, will be approved for 12 to 17 years of age um, shortly. I don't have a timeline on that, but uh, then we will have the choice of uh, uh, Pfizer or BioNTech depending on the availability of these vaccines. So, and then specific to the topic of uh, 12 plus, like what does 12 means? Is it going by the calendar year or the birth year of this uh, uh, individuals? Based on the, again, regulatory approval, this vaccine has been tested on anyone who is 12 years and older. So even though they, uh, some children may not necessarily be 12 at this time, maybe a month or two shy from uh, getting to 12 years, uh, but because of the regulatory approval process, they are not eligible uh, to get the vaccine at the mass vaccination site. There may be opportunity for them to get the vaccine through the primary care providers after having a good discussion about the risk and benefit and the, the data, whether it exists or it doesn't exist, and what does it mean for your specific child if they are not 
uh, if they're not 12 years and older by age and uh, whether it is appropriate for them to get the vaccine. So right now, from our mass vaccination clinic, it would be only for children who have uh, who are either 12 years and older can get the vaccine. Um, the other question that Mike you asked is about uh, if, what if if someone has already contracted COVID-19 if a child. Uh, so the recommendation is the same for uh, the children as well as for adults. Anyone who has who has COVID in the past, they should also get the vaccine. And the reason for these coronavirus, they 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 tend to uh, their immunity doesn't last lifelong, and there is a, a potentially a risk that uh, the immunity might wane and uh, you're, the person can get reinfected with COVID. We have seen that in, in some of the clinical data that uh, even in, in our community, someone who was previously um, uh, positive, they were positive again because of the reinfection piece. So the recommendation at this time, even if you're a child, if you're an adult, if you have previously contracted COVID-19, you should still get the vaccine to consider yourself fully vaccinated. The third aspect of this uh, question is about the medical condition um, and if someone has a medical condition, it's always the best idea to talk to your healthcare provider and your healthcare provider would be um, uh, the best judge in terms of what specific medical conditions you have and whether you should get the vaccine or not. So those are the um, uh, individuals. Uh, if, you, if your child has any kind of medical condition, please connect with your healthcare provider to get the best advice. Uh, actually, Dr. Ahmed, we just received a question about when do we anticipate 12 year olds being able to receive second doses? Um, it's a good question. Uh, uh, so we anticipate that, uh, well, ideally, I, I, I want to vaccinate everyone in our Windsor Essex uh, with their second dose before we head into fall. Um, under the Ministry of Education uh, guidance, they are requesting that the children should be vaccinated with their second dose before they start their school year. So we're hoping that if all works out well, we will be in a better position to vaccinate all the children before they go back to the school. Um, so that's the timeline that we are working on, but uh, all of that is subject to the availability of the vaccine and the supply that we receive. Okay. Um... Another question in our themes, is there any indication that the uh, vaccine will be approved for those under 12? Any timelines known, risk to unvaccinated children for COVID and uh, contacting uh, variants of concern? So another great uh, question uh, from a vaccine approval perspective. We know that uh, um, majority of the vaccine that is uh, that we use in preventing uh, some of these deadly infectious diseases uh, that we have seen in the world, uh, we give it to the children just to help them build that immunity and uh, recognizing that that's the time that they are most vulnerable. And uh, so I anticipate that there will be um, more research and more data of vaccine approval in under 12 years of age. And uh, I don't have a timeline in terms of when it will be approved, but I'm sure that uh, uh, the research is underway and uh, we'll, we'll have much better data to play with. Regarding the risks to unvaccinated children for COVID, and uh, this is something that I think it purely depends on the, um, the background prevalence of COVID in our community. So back in December, if you recall, our background case rate were really high, more than 350 cases per 100,000 population. And we made the decision to close the school because of the high prevalence of COVID-19 cases, potentially you know, putting our schools at a higher risk of spreading COVID just because the community background case rates were really high. So we, we anticipate that as more and more people are getting the vaccine, the prevalence of COVID-19 in our community is declining. The risk to children who are unvaccinated or who are not eligible to vaccine at this time will be much lower. And uh, ideally, when we get to the point of vaccinating them, we would want to, but uh, we recognize that the risk would be much lower uh, when the overall community vaccination rate is high and our prevalence of COVID-19 cases in the community declines uh, as uh, it is declining right now. 
Um, third question theme. What is the efficacy of vaccines for preventing COVID-19 disease or transmission afterwards? How well do they protect against variants? So COVID-19 vaccine, uh, just like any other vaccine, helps the body to identify the virus or virus particle and uh, build the immunity to fight these viruses. And essentially, this means that it reduces the risk of getting COVID uh, uh, from um, um, or making symptoms worse if you contract or if you're exposed to the virus. And uh, this has been always all along the mechanism for preventing these uh, diseases to um, uh, to affect uh, us. And uh, with with any kind of vaccine, obviously, uh, the based on how the body reacts, the immunity is not necessarily it's guaranteed that you will not develop the disease. Uh, but we know with the effectiveness data and everything that uh, it is it is almost 100 percent effective in some cases in preventing any uh, severe complications associated with COVID. So even if someone contracts COVID, the symptoms will be really mild and uh, it would not result in any severe consequences to uh, to the individual who is vaccinated. But please note that when you get the vaccine, it takes some time for body to build the immunity. It could take up to 14 days for uh, individuals to build uh, some kind of immunity uh, after receiving the vaccine. And uh, we know most of the vaccine that is available in Canada, except for Janssen, it's a two dose vaccine. And uh, we need to ensure that uh, um, everyone completes the series uh, before uh, they are considered immune. Um, next question from the themes. Why is it important to vaccinate youth when they have better outcomes than adults or when immunity is not guaranteed? Well, I think uh, when we are talking about overall community and how the uh, the any susceptible individual can contract COVID and pass it on to others. And uh, some of these individuals may develop more severe consequences. So it is important for everyone to have the vaccine. So there is no susceptible host or individual to, uh, to have the virus. And every susceptible host the virus finds, it tends to multiply, it tends to replicate, and it tends to in its tends to continue on replicating and potentially converting into some kind of a, a variant which could be more severe and which could have uh, um, an impact in the community. So we want in an ideal way that everyone is vaccinated so the, uh, the, the virus will not find a viable host to survive and then eventually disappear just like we have uh, uh, made uh, some of these deadly infectious diseases of the past uh, no longer we don't we no longer see those diseases and thanks to the vaccine and thanks to the effectiveness of these vaccines we have we are in that position to keep our children safe and uh, ensure that uh, they have uh, um, uh, that they are protected from all of these uh, all of these uh, deadly infectious diseases okay uh, theme five <clears throat> what short-term and long-term side effects have been shown in studies for youth? Uh, parents are concerned with the studies I've heard of which showed side effects for youth, such as the effects of spike proteins on other body systems. Uh, so that your question again, Mike? Sure. What are the short and long-term side effects that have been shown in studies for youth? Uh, some parents are concerned with uh, what the studies are showing uh, as far as side effects for youth such as spike proteins or other on the body other body systems I guess mm -hmm. well I think uh, what we know it's uh, again uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, virus uh, SARS-CoV-2 it's still it's a relatively new virus we're still learning more and more about this virus in terms of its impact and how it affects people when we're talking about the, the, the side effects of these vaccines, some of these side effects are pretty common side effects that is associated with the, almost all of these vaccines. So it doesn't matter which vaccine you're getting. Most common side effects are the vaccine site uh, uh, pain, 
uh, and rash and uh, mild fever. And all of those indications are basically just telling you that your, your body is fighting off the virus particle and is generating that immune response. And it's not nothing, it's nothing that, uh, uh, that should be concerning as long as it, uh, it is mild and uh, it disappears. So you will notice that the symptoms start to disappear after 24 hours. And if it doesn't, then that's where you need to get some medical uh, opinion just to make sure that uh, uh, there is no other uh, process that's going on in your body. Very rarely there is there are some sp specific uh, or extreme side effects that uh, uh, that we we tend to see with the vaccine, and when we see that, then those are the uh, vaccine that we tend to uh, put on hold, uh, just like we did for AstraZeneca when we figured out that the risk associated with the risk and benefit uh, uh, proportion is uh, tilting uh, more in terms of uh, a potential risk we stop those vaccine and that's always been the case. So vaccine safety is an ongoing issue that we continue to monitor. And any of these vaccine related issues that we see, there are uh, data collected locally, shared provincially and then shared federally. And then at some point it's shared internationally to make sure that all the countries that are using some of these vaccine, it uh, uh, can, can learn from these uh, side effects and potentially either uh, you know come up with the with the treatment solution or maybe making any changes in the recommendations based on the side effects that we see okay next uh, themed question why should i trust the safety of these new vaccines shouldn't we wait until more is known since they were developed quickly i'm concerned um, it is not truly approved and is an experimental vaccine um, so um, it's not an experiment, it's experimental vaccine. So let's just let's just be clear. The safety of these vaccines are uh, a very very important priority for all the healthcare professionals. This vaccine is not developed quickly. This vaccine followed all the uh, same regulatory approval process, just like any other vaccines have been approved in Canada and will continue to be approved in Canada. So there is no shortcut. There is nothing that uh, was done quickly other than uh, looking at the data on a rolling basis. This is called a rolling review. So for when the companies are doing the clinical trials, so there's clinical trial phase one, phase two, phase three. So all of these trial data, the moment uh, these companies complete a phase one or phase two, it would be approved to, uh, they, they share that data with the regulatory authorities such as Health Canada. And then Health Canada look at that data and then they uh, continue to look at that data while the company uh, on their own move on to the second uh, clinic, uh, phase two clinical trial data. And then after the phase two clinical trial data, they, they, they continue to review that data and phase three clinical data is, is come up. When all of that data came up, then the regulatory authorities already have the opportunity to look at that information on a rolling basis. And when they then they pool all that information to make a recommendation whether the vaccine is safe and effective. And that's what uh, they use in their decision making process. So just completely, uh, it's not true that uh, these are the vaccines that uh, uh, have been rushed so quickly. There are some processes involved to ensure that the safety of these vaccines have been kept into the mind at all times and will continue to do that uh, we'll, with all the vaccines that are approved in Canada. Uh, next question theme uh, revolves around COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, when do we anticipate they'll be lifted? Will vaccination allow for masks not to be worn? Uh, can you travel after being vaccinated? Uh, a great question. So we are already seeing some of the benefit of these vaccines and how the vaccines are uh, helping us to uh, to fight this pandemic. Uh, looking at what the success we have uh, we have achieved with the COVID vaccination rate in our long term care home is uh, is already evident. We were seeing many, many cases. We were seeing people dying in these long term care home and retirement home facilities. And uh, now we are not seeing any of the uh, of these outbreak. And uh, so it is important that uh, 
we are we see the benefit of these vaccines and then eventually we started lifting some of those restrictions at the long-term care home and retirement home and now they are able to meet their loved ones they're able to have visitation and uh, as the province is moving to stay step one of easing the restrictions we will continue to ease the restrictions as we continue to see the case rates dropping down and we are continue to see the vaccination coverage rate and uh, so all these restrictions eventually it will go away but uh, right now I don't have a timeline then when everything will be lifted there's ongoing active conversation regarding what would happen for with people who are fully vaccinated from a travel perspective whether they will be allowed to travel in some countries there has been some talk about uh, uh, um, the proof of immunization when people are traveling and and so on so there will be more guidance that will come up, but uh, clearly the whole idea or a more sustainable solution for this pandemic is the vaccine. And as uh, we are seeing the benefit of vaccine in Canada and in other parts of the world, these restrictions will eventually go away. The next question that we have is also a few questions that are in the chat just regarding will vaccination be mandatory for my child in order to attend school? So uh, this uh, is a provincial decision and uh, we haven't seen any mandate by the province that if this would be something that would be mandatory for the school children. Right now it is uh, recommended uh, and uh, I would strongly recommend that too. In some workplaces, we are already seeing that uh, it is becoming a requirement, such as the long-term care home uh, healthcare worker and the retirement home healthcare worker, that they have to have uh, a proof of vaccination or uh, a medical exemption if they need. So uh, I haven't seen that for the school children. So I am not sure what the future would look like. But again, before it becomes mandatory, I think it's important that we recognize that these vaccines save lives and these vaccines have prevented many, many other uh, pandemics and uh, has saved lives uh, from some of the deadliest infectious diseases that we have seen in the world. And uh, it is important that uh, we take that time to vaccinate rather than, uh, you know, uh, the it becomes mandatory. So I think that uh, uh, it at this time, obviously, it would be a recommendation, but we don't know what the provincial government decide. Uh, we've already touched on the timing of the second dose. Um, question is in regards to effects uh, of second dose and mac uh, mixing vaccine types. Uh, and then there's also a question in the chat of just regarding a booster as well. So uh, the uh, second dose uh, uh, timing. Um, so in Canada, when we started to see the vaccine coming in and uh, the uh, the recommendations for these vaccine initially it was extended the second dose interval to 16 weeks and this was done for very good reason to ensure that uh, uh, the uh, based on the data that we had with uh, how effective these vaccines are after receiving the first dose and then uh, the how the effectiveness would change for the second dose so in any type of vaccine series, when it's more than one series, you get the first vaccine, your body builds that uh, immune response, learn how to fight the, the new virus that will be introduced into the body in the future, if at all. And then the second dose basically just prolongs the duration of immunity because and then it just, whatever is the reminder, you are reminding it again that this is what the virus looks like and then the body is ready to fight off this infection. And then the, 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 the immune system remembers that this is the type of uh, 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 spike protein or this is the type of virus that you will see in the future so be ready so the interval was 16 weeks the the clinical trial data obviously is 21 or 28 days and again that's for the good reason because of the shortened interval and then how these immune response generates in the body so right now the uh, with the more availability of the vaccine the duration interval is being reduced just to allow more and more people to get full protection by having the second dose uh, at this time we don't know whether we would need the booster dose or not we will have to continue to see the how long the immunity lasts with the two doses of the vaccine and then if uh, they're let's say down the road a year from now or two years from now 
if there is any evidence that the immunity is declining then and COVID continues to be an ongoing problem, then we may need to look at the booster dose. So at this time, there is nothing that we can say that uh, uh, that we need the booster dose. Last comment on mixing the different types of vaccines. So vaccine mixing uh, with the same kind has it, it's not a new concept. So it is a concept that has been used in the past as well, and uh, we continue to use. So uh, so many of the vaccines such as hepatitis B vaccine, uh, shingles vaccine, there are va vaccine that uh, who use the same mechanism to generate the immune response. They, they are mixed and matched if they're produced by different companies and uh, uh, with, with the same results. In a, the, based on the new guidance, if someone has received any kind of mRNA vaccine, they can get the second dose of mRNA vaccine of a different uh, brand because they both work the same way and there is uh, um, uh, no harm in receiving a different type of uh, mRNA vaccine um, uh, as a second dose. But preferentially, we would want people to continue to be using the same vaccine that they've used, uh, received for their first dose and get the same vaccine. Uh, AstraZeneca is a different uh, thing altogether. So focusing just on the children. So those are the two vaccines that are available. So right now we know it's just the Pfizer, but in the future we may anticipate that uh, uh, we'll see Moderna and mixing and matching between those two vaccine uh, it shouldn't be any issue at all. And it is not something that uh, um, that we want to do it intentionally, especially if we have va the vaccine. If there's any shortage of vaccine or if there's non-availability of the vaccine, then we will uh, make those recommendations. But at this time, preferentially, we want people to use the same vaccine that they've received for their first dose. Uh, just looking, <clears throat> pardon me, just looking at the questions, um, in the chat, wondering, uh, do you have a current percentage uh, as to how many 12 to 17 year olds have received the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine? Um, so great question. From a coverage perspective, um, I think what the what the challenge we have is the denominator. So any anytime, as you know, if we are trying to calculate the percentage, we obviously are looking to know what is the total uh, population size uh, of that uh, 12 to 17 age group. And uh, uh, based on the last census data, obviously, which is dated already four to five years, uh, we are using a different denominator that's uh, being used by the province as well. So with that in mind, we have vaccinated more than 12,000 children in that age group which roughly represent almost 40% of our children, 12 to 17 years vaccinated in our community. Um, just following up on the numbers question, are children 12 and older being vaccinated globally outside of Canada and the US? Well, the, it depends on the vaccine that is available. And uh, if there is uh, uh, safety data on those vaccines for, uh, for that age bracket. So most of the vaccine that is currently being used in other parts of the world are only tested in, uh, in adults, 18 plus. So those are the vaccine that they're using. And very few countries uh, uh, are using uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine at this time, which is the only vaccine so far uh, approved for 12 plus age group, uh, to my knowledge. And uh, it's being used, obviously, uh, in uh, it's been used in, in US, in Canada, and in uh, some European countries as well. Okay, I know we've had a few people join late, so if people do have questions, we ask that you enter them into the chat. Um, one of the questions that we received was regarding accommodations for special needs children uh, to get vaccinated at a clinic. I wonder if you can comment on that, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, so with respect to accommodation, I think uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And uh, ideally, we want some of these accommodation requests are people who have any concerns uh, or who may not be well suited for the mass vaccination clinic is to connect with their healthcare provider and see if they're offering the vaccine. It would be much easier for them to connect with their primary care providers uh, to get the vaccine through that way. But for anyone else, if, there are, if they don't have a primary care provider and if they're still struggling, I think it would be uh, worthwhile for them to try and connect with our team and see what we can do. 
but recognizing that the mass vaccination clinics are designed for the masses and uh, uh, it, uh, it's, it may not be as friendly uh, when it comes to the accommodation piece. We do everything we can, but uh, the best option would be to connect with your healthcare provider to see if they're, um, uh, if they're able to offer that accommodation to your specific child. A uh, question from the chat. Uh, what is the vaccine supply looking like since expanding the age groups? Um, do you still foresee uh, everyone vaccinated by the fall? Uh, I do. And, and I think those are all in the um, um, based on the projection that we are seeing that we receive from the ministry as well as uh, from our federal government partners. Uh, they share their allocation with the with the province, and the province share our allocation uh, with uh, with us. And uh, based on that, we do um, think that uh, it would be we will be in a much better spot, especially before moving into fall. That we should be we should have enough vaccine to offer second dose to everyone in our region. Uh, I think we've addressed most of the questions from that were submitted uh, over 120 themed together. Um, there's a few more in the chat. Um, are allergic reactions side effects common in younger teens? Uh, not really. Uh, the allergic reaction, children don't get that allergic reaction as uh, many of the adults. And uh, it's uh, so looking at if you have received, if you had some allergic reaction, doesn't necessarily mean that your child will have the same allergic reaction. Um, everyone's body, everyone's immune risk system reacts differently. And uh, I, if you, if there's any history of allergy, obviously it would be worthwhile to have a conversation with your primary care provider. Uh, but generally speaking, it uh, should not uh, affect anyone um, just because if you had the uh, a reaction, others will have the same reaction. Sorry, I'm just reviewing the questions in the chat. Again, if people want to ask questions, please enter the questions in the chat. We continue to be asked questions about long-term and short-term side effects. Um, so, um, and, and I'm just looking at the last part comment as well. Do you feel it's safe for children? Um, and uh, I got my child vaccinated. That should be uh, uh, a trigger for people who are thinking that uh, if I don't believe in the safety and effectiveness of this vaccine and uh, my, almost every healthcare providers have got their vaccine and uh, including their children. So from a safety perspective, there is no concern uh, from them. Regarding the uh, fertility issue or long term issues that uh, um, uh, that people are uh, reading in online, those are the uh, uh, comments that has always have been arise uh, have have been in, in there for a long time. Every time a new vaccine comes in, and uh, unfortunately by the same people, and uh, it is not something that has proven so far that has and will have any impact on the uh, fertility or any reproduction ability to uh, to the children. And uh, there is you always have to think about, OK, what is the proposed mechanism of action that that is concerning for you or anyone else to um, uh, that would prompt you to think that this is the concern? And I know um, there have been some questions about, well, this is an mRNA vaccine and uh, it is a different vaccine and that's why the concern is but if you if you know mrna vaccine is a protein it doesn't enter the the nucleus of the cell so any vaccine that is going in the vaccine the the spike protein that the mrna vaccine generates the cell identifies those spike protein develops the immune response against it and then acts to identify and build that keep that immunity in the in the mind so it has it has no implications in, with respect to DNA. It doesn't affect it doesn't alter your DNA at all. 
and it doesn't even enter the nucleus where the cell center is. So it's uh, those are the questions that have always been um, you know, raised with no uh, validity to it or no real data to suggest uh, uh, sort of support that claim. Uh, there was a recent question just regarding eligibility and if there's any case or any cases where an adult or a child would be considered not eligible to get the vaccine. So from an eligibility perspective, obviously, um, it's uh, uh, the vaccine is approved for use in anyone who is 12 years and older. So that's the eligibility criteria. From a risk perspective, we uh, the the vaccine is not recommended to anyone who've who've had a severe reaction to any component of the vaccine. This is true for any of the vaccine because we definitely um, uh, don't want to see any severe allergic reaction if someone had a previous allergy to the vaccine and especially the component of this particular vaccine. So those va those individuals will not be eligible to receive the vaccine, but for everyone else. Uh, if they're 12 years and older, they should be able to, uh, they are all eligible to receive the vaccine. Question that just came up on the chat. Will students be wearing masks and teachers in September? Um, so I uh, I don't have a, a sideline on that. September is too far away. We don't know what the cases looks like based on the reopening framework that we have in Ontario, we should be in stage three or uh, step three of the reopening of uh, the province. And uh, as more and more evidence are coming in from uh, the um, um, after people are fully vaccinated, um, I anticipate that there may be some changes with respect to mask rule. I don't know if it would happen in September, but uh, it would happen at some time to um, um, to, to update those recommendations. Sorry, I'm just reviewing the questions. So there's a question, Mike, uh, I, that I want to uh, address. I think it's just right after that, uh, the risk of uh, heart inflammation, or, uh, heart inflammation or myocarditis. Um, and uh, so just a quick note on that, that, uh, you know, as we talked about the vaccine safety at all times, uh, we do look into all the events and uh, any kind of adverse event that happen uh, that is associated with the vaccine. It is uh, it is reported to public health. And then we look at all that reports and uh, uh, we uh, try to assess some uh, causal link with the vaccine sometimes or I would say most of the time there is no link to the vaccine. Uh, and uh, despite that, all of that data is uploaded to the provincial database and then to the federal database. So myocarditis or the inflammation of the heart is something that uh, was, uh, that is currently being looked at because of uh, uh, some reports, uh, some case reports that are out there uh, from Israel. And uh, the the risk at this time is still uh, very low to to make any recommendations or to change any recommendations uh, so far, and uh, we'll continue to evaluate the risk and benefit of uh, uh, these vaccine and especially these rare side effects. And if there is any risk or concerns to the public, this would be updated uh, updated accordingly to ensure the uh, that we are not. Uh, putting anyone at risk uh, uh, with this vaccine. Uh, one of the questions, uh, do you have a percentage available of individuals who have passed from COVID that were vaccinated? And I think you addressed that at um, one of the epi summaries last week or the week before. So percentage of individuals are passed on from COVID but were vaccinated. I, I so the it, in, it has been um, I guess uh, a challenge in 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 terms of uh, correctly classifying individuals who died with COVID, and or if uh, we're looking at uh, you know any individual who have passed on from COVID that were vaccinated. There could be many reasons for people to die, and uh, especially uh, you know many medical com complications associated with that. So we we don't have an exact 
data on that number. I did ask our epi to see if there's any way that we can do that. So right now, the, the two databases do not talk to each other. Uh, the vaccination database as, and then the CCM, which includes all the case and contact management database. So it's it's difficult to link some of these cases, but uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll try our best to see if we can provide that information. But at this time, I don't have that information to share that uh, um, that if uh, individuals passed away from COVID despite the vaccination. So it uh, um, it would be uh, something that we need to look at. Sorry, Dr. Ahmed, I'm just going mm -hmm. through the questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what major differences are we seeing between countries who are providing second dose on time versus our extended timeline? Um, so there is a, a good data now, which basically suggested that with the extended timeline, it generated a better immune response, even with for uh, for the mRNA vaccine. We know for sure that there is good data uh, from UK that uh, showed that AstraZeneca received uh, second doses of AstraZeneca received after 12 weeks. It has generated a much better response than those who have received it at an earlier timeline. So again, going back to how the vaccine works. So you get your first dose, your body recognizes the immune, uh, the, the the viral protein or the components of the viral uh, virus and then generate that immune response. So increasing the interval up to a point where the body still remembers the, uh, the, um, um, uh, the virus and then getting the second dose as a booster, it definitely prolongs the immunity for a much longer period of time. So the, the data, what we are seeing from USA and Canada, if we just wanna you know, look at our neighbors, it is uh, it is pretty much the same. So we are looking at uh, uh, there is nothing that happened. In fact, uh, you know what we found from the scientific studies that uh, Canada made a good choice by extending the interval because it did allow us to vaccinate more people in a short period of time to to contain the this pandemic, which otherwise would have been difficult when we have more and more susceptible individuals. Uh, the effectiveness of these vaccines, even after one dose, is more than 80%, so which is a really good effectiveness rate that allowed us to uh, use that data. And uh, um, Europe also used the same extended interval, not to the same one that we are using, but they also used the same, went ahead with the same interval. Now they're doing their second doses. US didn't change their uh, re recommended interval, and they stick to what the uh, what the manufacturer suggested and looking at the data from an effectiveness perspective it's basically the same right now our vaccination coverage rate is much higher than uh, usa and uk uh, with at least one dose of the vaccine and we are on track to even surpass um, 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 israel which was one of the country that was uh, uh, noted to have a higher vaccination rate so we are on the trajectory to surpass their vaccination rate as well. And when the second dose is coming in, we'll be in a much better spot with our vaccine coverage rate. Uh, one question in the chat was regarding consent. If a 13 year old wants to be vaccinated, do they need their parents consent? Uh, so great question. Um, in Canada, there is no age of consent. And uh, uh, this is true not only for the vaccine, but for any kind of medical treatment or anything uh, that, uh, that, uh, that they want. Um, the child has to be the mental capacity to understand what the risks and benefits are for any specific treatment or intervention that they are requesting. And that is something that uh, typically a healthcare provider assess and make that determination that if the child truly understand that. So there is no age of consent in Canada uh, in the healthcare system, but we do want people to have that discussion and have a consent, parental consent. Uh, so everyone is aware of uh, uh, what is happening, but uh, in situation, if, uh, it is not a requirement for uh, anyone to get the vaccine, but we do encourage people to talk um, uh, within the family and get the awareness and get the vaccine. Um, 
just looking at all of the questions, I believe we've answered most of them. Um, I don't know if uh, you want, had any final comments, Dr. Ahmed, and then we can wrap up the session. No, I think uh, uh, it's uh, it's great um, and that uh, uh, we had a, a good participation, uh, some really good questions. And uh, I hope that um, you know uh, this has been helpful for all of you. Uh, and uh, this is a dialogue, as we always say. Um, and um, you know, connect with your healthcare provider if you still have some outstanding questions. And uh, you know, don't fall into the misinformation. Don't fall into the people who are uh, who are continuing to spread misinformation at all times. Talk to your healthcare provider, talk to the professionals and get your information from, um, um, uh, from uh, trusted sources. Uh, so that's what I would say. And uh, that's it, Mike. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for answering all of the questions today. We are, we have recorded this session. We do plan on putting it on YouTube for other parents who weren't able to join us to watch. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, have yourself a great night. And uh, again, thank you.